Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name's Polly and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> By God's grace, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since April the 11th of 1977, and for that I am eternally grateful. Um, I want to say I have a home group, because that's what I always say, but I don't right now, because uh, two weeks, about two and a half weeks ago, Dave and I moved from Birch Bay, Washington, which is the most northern tip, north the northwestern corner of the United States, right across from Canada, to Jacksonville, Florida. (laughs) Now, so I don't have a home group, Uh, but I'm going to lots of meetings, and I'm pretty sure what's going to be my home group, but I haven't made that decision yet. Anyway, I have a sponsor, and my sponsor has a sponsor, and uh, those are the things I need to have to be a good member in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, and that's being a good member. What I need to do to continue to recover, and I loved your talk last night. Why are we here? I'm here so that I continue to recover from the disease of alcoholism. And in order to do that, I need to work the steps. I need to work the traditions. I need to work or I need to apply the traditions and the concepts to my life. And those are the things that I need. Because if I stop doing that, then I'll lose my relationship with God. And God is who keeps me sober. Um, I am delighted to be here. And uh, Lee's who invited me. But I think Anne's, I want to thank Anne for having the dream, the idea, and getting it going. Look at first time out of the shoot. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I, I had no idea where I was coming. I thought it was in Washington, D.C., because they flew me into National. And so I thought it was around there. So Candy and Jeff picked me up, and she's so good. She said, I mean, we make a plan, and I'm like, you know, I'm always telling my husband, focus and finish. And... <laughs> So, <laughs> so <laughs> I was focused. So the plan was that I go outside and meet her in a dark green Ray 4. And so I'm looking, now is this going to be like Seattle or is this going to be like Chicago where I have to go across the street and over to the other side to be picked up? And all the time, Candy's standing here with a sign with my name on it and I never saw it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so then she calls me and I said, oh, I'm standing out here on the curb waiting for you. She said, I just saw you pass by me. <laughs> And then we get in the car, and then we're driving and driving and driving. I said, where are we going? I thought this was in D.C., and she said, oh, no, we're about 70 miles from National Airport. I'm like, what? And she lives here, and she drove there and drove me back. And tomorrow morning, she'll drive me there and drive me back. Now, I'm with you, Bob. That probably is about 200 miles past any links, I would think. (laughs) Thank you so much. Took me to lunch. We had a great time. Showed me around uh, Solomon's Island. And, oh, it was just, it was great. And I, I lived in Glen Burnie, Maryland. And so I, but I never was here. I was, um, my first husband was stationed at the National Security Agency, and I lived in Glen Burnie, Maryland. So I lived here for quite a few years, and uh, 
I love this country. I think this is absolutely beautiful country. So uh, you guys are very blessed, very blessed. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about fear and sex, but um, and isn't that attractive? I don't look like a, you know, I don't look like somebody will be talking about fear and sex. Uh, nice little old lady like me. <laughs> First off, since Clancy's not here and Sandy's not here and Tom I's not here, I am the oldest person with my little group I've been hanging around chronologically, not in sobriety, but chronologically, and I don't know how that happened. I just don't know how that happened. <laughs> and uh, also, I was talking, I, I ran out while Bob was talking because I got a phone call from my son, and so I wanted to catch it because I knew he, it would probably be my window of opportunity to speak to him. So I ran out and took the phone call, and uh, so I was talking to him. He said, oh, Mom, he said, are you speaking tomorrow morning? And I said, no. I said, I'm speaking after Bob. Bob's doing resentments, and I'm doing sex and fear. And he says, oh, thank you, God, that I don't have to be there to hear my mom talk about sex. <laughs> So, <laughs> anyway, uh, I am with my most favorite people on the planet. I love these people that I'm with. And probably the person that I've been hanging out with the longest is Don. Don and I have been, we were brand new just about when we started talking. And uh, young in sobriety, young in sobriety. Uh, well, I wasn't that young. You were young. I was 10. <laughs> you were you were the one who was young, and uh, I'm with Lee, and I'm so excited because now I live two hours from Lee, so that's that's fantastic. But I was listening last night to Ralph talk, and uh, you and Bob just you know you kicked it out of the park. I know everybody else will too, but you guys were great, and you were talking about stability. Well. Uh, when you're talking about that, I keep thinking. I'm 30, almost 34 years sober next month. Dave will be 35 years sober. I'm 70 years old. Dave's 75 years old. And here we are. We moved from, well, we've moved a lot. But in the last 20, in the last 30 years, we've moved from uh, Michigan. Well, let's give them all to you. Texas, Michigan. California, back to Texas, back to California. Then we retired and moved up to Birch Bay, Washington, and we just now moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Now, I don't know about you, but I, that probably doesn't sound very stable, you know, and uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe we just have gypsy in our blood. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's okay. And uh, we were packed up. We sold uh, most of our furniture, but if I'm really honest and tell the truth, I say that we gave it away to make a real estate deal go through is what we really did. And we gave away our furniture, so we have about four pieces of furniture and some boxes coming, and that was packed up on the 15th of February. So anyway, we arrived in Florida on the 21st of February. And I want you to know, to, de to date, that stuff has not arrived. So here we are, 34, 35 years sober. I mean, this is something to shoot for, newcomers, okay? <laughs> 70 and 75, and we have a bed. We bought that at Costco. We have a TV. We bought that at Costco. And we have two lawn chairs that a sponsee loaned us. <laughs> I went to Dillard's and bought a skirt because I never dreamed that my stuff wouldn't be here by now. So I didn't have any clothes. And all everything, I mean, you know, I was in jeans and stuff like that because I'm coming across country. And... Uh, and then I'm going to be in Florida, for God's sakes. And I'm not speaking until last weekend, so I had to... I mean, who would have thought? So I want to have a fit. 
So let me just show you what 11 months more of sobriety will get you. I want to have a fit with the movers. And Dave takes my hand and he says, Honey, we're not going to have a fit. <laughs> we're just going to wait till the movers get here. So that's I'm glad that I have Dave in my life because I'm a little feisty and Dave's just kind of steady as you go. And Andy DeLuca's back there shaking his head because he knows my day. And he's just, you know, we're not going to get upset. We're doing just fine. We don't need any more. Puppies are happy. I'm happy. And you can get happy. (laughs) So, (laughs) So, you know, life's great. And so it's just, you know, change, change. And in a sense, there's a lot of excitement about it all. I mean, my heart's breaking on the one hand because I loved my life in Bellingham, Washington, the wonderful place to live. The AA is fabulous. Uh, We started a conference there, of which Bob was the first phone call I made to help us kick it off uh, six years ago. And when we did that and uh, and I just and I we created the fellowship we craved and it's it's fabulous. And uh, I don't need to do that. That's already there in Jacksonville. But Dave and I loved it there. But on the other hand, I'm so excited to the the people I'm meeting and the things that I'm doing. And I tell you, I cannot complain about the sun. The sun is absolutely great. And uh, so one of the things that and oh, I'm going to I'm going to get on a soapbox for a minute. And the reason I'm going to do this and I'll only do it for one minute and it's my microphone. So I'm going to do it. Somebody came up to me and said, was talking about uh, the speakers and people giving their last name in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And let me just tell you uh, that that's a violation of the traditions. No, it's not. Dr. Bob said, we are not anonymous amongst ourselves. And let me tell you, if you've got a friend in the hospital it's really hard to go find Salty Dog Bob. <laughs> it's just really hard. If you're coming to Jacksonville, Florida, I hope if you don't have my phone number on you, I hope that you'll just call 411 and ask for Dave or Polly Pistol, and we're in the phone book, and we'll take you to a meeting. And I guarantee you, if you call and ask the operator for Polly P. or David P., they ain't going to have it. (laughs) So just remember, we're not anonymous amongst ourselves, but we are anonymous at the public level. That's where we're anonymous at, but not amongst ourselves. So thank you (laughs) for my little soapbox. I appreciate that. Okay. My, my duty today is fear and sex, and uh, I just want you to know that I am a person, and uh, Bob started talking about it earlier, and it seems funny to, re- to follow you with resentment except when we do the big book, because I'm usually following Ralph <laughs> but on these, but it's, it's great, because um, I'm really, it's, I know these guys, it's just, this is, a, what a joy. What a pleasure. I just, I feel so honored. I'm just like so honored with the people that are here and to be here in Maryland and seeing a lot of people I haven't seen before and being with some sponsees. It's just, it's just fabulous. Anyway, I am a person who has been driven by a hundred forms of fear. I am a fearful person. And I'm going to just tell you, I have been in a lot of fear this past year. And I'm just going to kind of just start with that because one of the things that I believe, well, maybe I should go, maybe I should go with the reading and then explain. Okay, it says, notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. The short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But did we not ourselves 
set the ball in motion. Sometimes we think fear ought to be classified with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. Fear. That's the thing that paralyzes me, is fear. We review our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. Even though we had no resentment in connection with them, we ask ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? And I'm going to move on down. And it says, perhaps there is a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis. The basis of trusting and relying upon God. And one of the things that you hear sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous is you can't have faith and fear at the same time. Now, I personally don't believe that, and the book doesn't say that. I think what the book says, we never apologize for depending on our Creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. And if we weren't afraid, we wouldn't need courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. They never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. And I have had this a lot in the past year. First of all, under a matter of circumstances, I came into the room of Alcoholics Anonymous full of fear. I have been afraid of everything. I'm, a, I'm afraid people are going to leave me. And my early fears were, I was afraid people were going to leave me. Nobody loves me. I'm going to be all alone. All of those, uh, those really blatant self, self, self-centered fears that we come into AA with. I am the kid. I have no credentials to be standing behind this mic except that I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and I am sober today. That's all the credentials that I have. I don't have never been to speech class. I've never been to any of that stuff. I'm the kid in school who had to stand up and give a book report. And if I had to do that, I was sick that day. And I don't mean just playing sick. I was sick because I was so afraid to stand up in front of people And today, thanks to inventory, I know why I was afraid to stand up in front of people. I was so afraid I wouldn't do it perfect, and I was afraid of what you would think of me. Everything was about what you thought of me. My whole idea on life, why I did things, I would do nice, kind things for you so you would love me. And then if you didn't appreciate me appropriately, then I just resented you. So everything, everything was driven by fear. I was afraid. I was afraid of people, places, and things. I was a young military wife. I just knew that all these women were sophisticated and educated and better than me. And it's always been that, that thing, you're better than me. And if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. Well, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't know that that was self-centered arrogance. I thought, I'm so humble. But see, I believe there's two sides to the spectrum. And there's the people who don't think much of themselves and the people who act really arrogant. Now, I have an AA sponsor who set, me, who set me straight really early, and she said, Polly, it's not necessary you think well of yourself. You just think only of yourself. <laughs> I'm always worried about what you think about me. So what that is is that me thinking about me. I'm not worried about how you feel. 
I'm worried about how you feel about me. So, and I didn't understand all that fear. And uh, I've had lots of fears. Fear of financial insecurity. I did not grow up with any money. My parents didn't have any money. I married an Air Force officer. Things were really good for a long time. Then my husband fell ill. Fell Ill. He was 100% disabled. And I was a young woman of 31, and I had to go to work and start to support our family because he was 100% disabled. And, I mean, he got some money, but it wasn't much money. So I've always had this fear of financial insecurity because I just always have felt like I didn't have enough money. And, uh, and then I, I ended up marrying Dave and Dave had, Dave was a, a computer scientist, had a really good job. And then in 1993, the bottom fell out of uh, aerospace. We were living in Southern California. He was laid off his job. And one more time, I end up being the breadwinner, and I keep being afraid of financial insecurity. And then here we go again. Dave and I work really hard. We save some money, and we go up to um, – we go up to Birch Bay and we build a house and everything is wonderful and we're living up there and then pretty soon the stock market, you know, here we go again into this, this kind of economy and the stock market tanks and there goes our money. So what happens is, is I've always had that, that fear of financial insecurity and I am just so grateful that I'm married to Dave. Because when this starts happening, Dave always said, Polly, God either is or he isn't. He's either all things or he's nothing. And he's going to take care of us. You know, all we've got to do is just trust him and show up for AA. That's all we have to do. And, you know, to me, I'm looking and going, here's the second verse of the same song, you know, that happened in 93. And, uh, and what happened was, is we ended up selling our house, we didn't make any money on it, but we didn't have to leave the key in the door, which is what we had to do the first time. And, uh, and I just, you know, kind of was just sitting there all puffed up when we were at the closing table, and Dave just sort of picked, you know, took my hand and said, well, honey, it's better than it was last time. But what happened was, is we had a little money from a little trailer that we sold up there also. We were able to buy a place in Florida and a little condo. And, you know, so what happens is, is what in, in God's world is that we had this heartbreak and Dave and I go to Jacksonville and we, and we, we buy somebody else's heartbreak. And, and I just, you know, and I'm just looking at my life and I always get in this fear. But what happens is, is that Over and over and over, for 34 years, over and over and over, God shows me, don't be afraid I'm here. Don't be afraid. You might not have a lot, but you'll always have enough. And you see, that's that's it. See, that's the arrogance of the alcoholic. You see, with me... It's not that I'll always have enough. I want a lot. (laughs) And that's the difference. And that's what brings on the fear. Because I've always been okay. Always, my entire life, I have been okay. I have never missed a meal, and I have never not had a place to sleep. Not ever. I have been taken care of. And you'd think at 70 years old, I'd trust that by now. That I would trust that God either is or he isn't. What is my choice to be? And the deal is, is that I can have fear and faith at the same time. I have the fear, but the faith in God will help me walk through the fear. 
and I've had other fears. Uh, my husband has, uh, five years ago, he had open heart surgery. Right now, he's suffering with a lot of arthritis. And, you know, I have fear. I have fear. I mean, uh, I don't want anything to happen to my husband. But then I was just so happy yesterday because he calls me on the phone and he said, a friend of ours has a, a beach bike and that's what I have. He has a real expensive mountain bike. I have a beach bike because I don't like gears and stuff. I learned to ride where you stopped with your feet and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so that's the kind of bike I ride. And so anyway, he said, I rode Mike's beach bike yesterday for about 20 miles. And I'm like, oh, yes. And he said, I loved it. I said, yeah, didn't have any gears, not fan fancy. They cost $80 at Walmart. And he just, you know, and he just laughed. But it's like, and I was, because I sometimes get afraid of that about my husband. And I have, I've got some things going on right now with one of my sons. And I get afraid that, uh, but then I talked to him this morning and he has more faith than I do. And he's saying, Mom, everything's in perfect order. And he's had to go through a lot of stuff that's really painful right now. And he says, who knows? He said, I guess I just need hum I just needed humbling. He said, because, boy, there are lots of people talking about me. And so it's just, you know, just taking, I'm watching these people, you know, in my life do things. And uh, I get to share with my friends, and they tell me the stuff they're going through. And I get to, I get to see that we all have this. Because whatever happens, I haven't left the human race yet. And what always this does for me is this just brings me back to the God of my understanding. Because what I need to know, I need to remember, is my reliance needs to be on God, not on me. My reliance, and I have a sponsor. I, I have a sponsor who loves God so much. And I've watched her walk through so much adversity in her life. And I watch her, and she never, ever fails to praise God for everything she has. And I just am so grateful that I have these people in my life because what will happen for me is I'll get in this fear, even with this much sobriety, I'll get in this fear, and I will be afraid that God's not going to take care of me, which he never has failed me. And I know that he's, and here I know that. Here I know that. But then when I start thinking, I get fearful, and I, you know, and I lose that connection from the head to the heart. Because logically, sometimes, it doesn't look like it ought to work out. It doesn't look like it ought to be okay. But what happens is, it's been my experience. And that's one of the things that I love about this kind of stuff that we, that we're, that we are having the privilege to do here. And that is, what we're sharing is our experience, strength, and hope. If you want me to be, I mean, I am, I, I love the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'm not as good at it and know it as well as some of the people that I love and admire. I'm not as good at it. I'm really grateful that you don't have to be in order to stay sober. I'm just really glad that we work the steps and we share our experience, strength, and hope. And that's what we share. And, uh, and I don't have any credentials either, Bob, to be, to be teaching the big book. I just, and I, sometimes I struggle through it too. And I don't, you know, one of my sponsees will say, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's go find out and figure it out together. You know, I don't know. Uh, I just, I haven't written that down in my book, so if I knew, I forgot it. So, you know, it's just that we work at this together. And I believe like you believe, and that is, is that the way I learn this is by working with others. I never have been one that was, I'm, a, I'm kind of an a experiential learner. That's the way I seem to learn things. And uh, I've been sponsoring people since I was about uh, five or six months sober. 
and I've been working and doing this stuff and stumbling through it for all these years. But the one thing that I am consistently doing all the time is working with others all the time. And it has worked for me. That My experience is it has worked for me. And I have worked with people who have had horrendous fears for really good reason. Really good reason. I've worked with women who have had things happen to them that no, no, should never happen to anybody. Horrific things. And there's good reason to be afraid. And they'll say to me things like, Polly, if God is so loving, why do these kind of things happen? And I just say, I don't know. I don't know why those kind of things happen. All I know is, is that for whatever reason, what has happening to you is going to help somebody else. Whatever you have been through, whatever I've been through, that experience, because that's all I have is my experience. I can share your, my knowledge, but I'm not very smart. I don't have a college education. I don't have that kind of retention. That's not me. But I can tell you this. I love working with other alcoholic women. I love it. That is absolutely my passion. And in doing so, they have healed me. Just exactly what Bob has said when he was talking about resentment. If it had not been for that, because I'm a person left to my own devices, would have, well, I wouldn't have blown my brains out because I'm very, I was very suicidal. I've, I've tried it many times. I was very suicidal till I was 12 years sober. And what I have found out is, thanks to the language of the heart, you know, some people think this is our only piece of literature. This is the best piece of literature, but it is not the only piece of literature. And the language of the heart saved my life because the language of the heart talks about our next frontier, emotional sobriety. Because I'm a Bill Wilson. I read everything I could ever find on Bill Wilson because he suffered from depression. And I do, too. And I can fall into it in a nanosecond if I'm not working with others. And he found the antidote for depression. And thanks to him and other members of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have too. And the antidote is working with others. Because whether I like it or not, I feel like to be depressed is the most self-centered thing I do. Because what it does is it turns me in to thinking about me. And that's a really bad place for me to go. So what happens is, is I want to hear about your fears. I want to hear about what's going on. I need to talk to you because I'm one of those alcoholics. She talked about the type A. The type A personality. I am one of those alcoholics that cannot spend any time in this head. This, as my husband says, my head is not my amigo. It is not my friend. <laughs> it makes me crazy. It gets me in fear. It makes me feel all these feelings that I get that are feelings of less than. So what I know to do is that turn at once. We're going to, uh, all men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to d remove our fear and direct our attention to what we, he would have us to be. And one of the things that I think, and our preamble says it, I may be a lot of things, but my primary purpose on this planet today is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. That's my job. That's it, period. That's my job. Now, anything else I get to have along the way is just whipped cream and cherries. But that's my job. That's what I'm here to do. And as long as I do that, 
as long as I keep, as long as I focus and finish and keep my eyes, you know, if I keep my eyes focused on what I'm supposed to do, then most of the time this stays pretty peaceful. Stays pretty peaceful. Okay. My favorite subject. Now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there, but above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. And uh, I'm going to talk about sex and uh, some of the things that have happened. I also use sex for me and the people I work with uh, for also for uh, harms done because the sex inventory is for the harms I've caused through my sexual behavior. Also, it's I may not have a resentment against somebody, but I may have harmed them. And that would be on this inventory as well. Okay, let's just start with one of the things, and I'm sure the men work with this because I have a husband who has been sexually abused. So I know that men have these problems too. But if you, with the women I work with, when they're talking about things that have happened to them and sexual abuse that has happened to them, that goes on the resentment list, not the sex list, not the uh, sex inventory. That's the resentment list. The sex inventory is for the people I've harmed. Okay? So one of the things that happened is when I first got sober, Uh, I got sober in Texas, and I went to treatment. I went to treatment three times. I was the reluctant to get sober. I didn't go as much as Bob, but I went a lot. (laughs) You've got the record, I think, Bob. (laughs) Uh, I went to treatment. And the last time I went to treatment, I stayed in treatment six weeks. And this treatment center was a five-step treatment center. And what we did is we were to finish the five steps before we left treatment. And so what happened was is the fourth step that they had us do in treatment was what Bob was talking about, the autobiography. And then when I went to my first AA sponsor who took me through the steps the first time, Frank said, that makes a great novel, but it does nothing for inventory. So he took me through the inventory as it's laid out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I had resentments, and I had a, a litany of fears, and, uh, but I didn't have much on sex because I was, you know, kind of one of these kids. It's, I know it happens at least in my generation more than it happens in any other. It has happened in, in the, my generation and the ones previous is a lot of us did go to our marriage as virgins because we didn't have any birth control. And, uh, and I can, you know, it was just a bad, it was bad if you got pregnant. And, uh, so I had, when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't really have a lot of stuff around sex. I knew that I was married to a military man and I knew that I used sex to get what I wanted. I mean, women have a, absolutely fabulous weapon (laughs) it's really sad guys but you fall for it every time (laughs) so and I had that weapon you know because he was going to come home he was going to say a few days or a few months and then off he was going to go into the wild blue yonder again and then I was back in charge doing whatever I wanted to do And uh, so I didn't have a lot going on in my sex inventory. But as years went along in my sobriety, I got a really big sex inventory. And uh, I would, in my talks till about five years ago, I always would allude to, uh, you know, all the fairs I had in early sobriety and, and that Dave and I have known each other since we were six months sober and that, you know, I had had these affairs and Dave knew more about me than he ought to and, 
and from the guys he sponsored that I had affairs with. And, you know, it was, and I, and everybody would do that. They'd laugh, and it was really funny, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Now, bearing in mind this whole time, I'm married. I'm married. And my husband is very ill. But I'm so selfish and self-centered that all I'm doing is fulfilling my own needs. And it's not that I, that it was all that great. I just felt like if you just love me, I just wanted the attention. And I wanted you to love me and I wanted you to care about me and, and just all that selfish, self-centered stuff. And, uh, and I, I was just oblivious to all the people in my life I was hurting. So at three and a half years sober, because uh, Dave and I had decided that we were going to get married. He was four and a half years sober, and I was three and a half years sober. And I never had an affair with Dave. Dave and I were friends. And Dave said to me, he said, Polly, I don't want to have an affair with you. I want to marry you. And, you know, he knew about me. And things like that shouldn't happen for people like me. But it did. And what happened as a result of that is I went to my AA sponsor. Because my AA sponsor had been a Monsignor priest. He'd been a captain in the Navy, and he was an only child. And I was raised Southern Baptist, and I was an only child, and I was, and I was an Air Force officer's wife. And um, for whatever reason, God put Frank and I together, and he was exactly who I needed. And I feel like that. I mean, we make a lot of judgments in AA, but what I really believe is is that God gives us exactly what we need and puts us together. It's God's business. I'm always trying to get in somebody else's business. But it's God's business how things work out. And if I let God unfold it, most of the time it works out fine. And so Frank was my first AA sponsor. And what had happened is he had stayed a priest until his mother died because his mother had always wanted him to be a priest. And when his mother died... He left the priesthood and married the Asian woman he had loved all his life. And I loved, even though there was 30 years difference in their age. And, you know, people would have a lot to say about that as well. And But what I saw was, is I saw this union that I loved, and I watched it. And so Frank knew about Dave. Frank knew all about me. And he said, well... You know, you started drinking at 18, and you woke up, and you were 18. And he said, and I'm really sorry you're having to hurt yourself like this, but, you know, I don't know what God's going to do with it. And that was Frank's attitude towards what was going on with me. And and I said, you know, I went to him, and I said, well, you know, I need to do an inventory. And he said, yeah, you do. And so I did an inventory on sex then. At three and a half years of sobriety, I did another inventory. I'd been doing continuous inventories, all this stuff, uh, constantly feeling bad about myself, beating myself up, but not really doing anything to change my behavior. So I did an inventory on the people I had hurt. And uh, the first person on that list was my husband. And I realized how much embarrassment I had caused him because it's not like he didn't know what was going on. I mean, I didn't tell him, but it's not like he didn't know what was going on. And I realized how much harm I had done him. And I put his name on the list, and I listed all the things I had done to hurt him, how I could have aroused jealousy, how I was inconsiderate, all the things that I had done, never taking his feelings into consideration to the behavior I was doing to fulfill my own self-centered feelings. And then I needed to look, what should I do instead? And all I kept saying was, is I want to be a faithful wife. I want to love one man all of my life. And I hadn't done this in this first marriage. I had not been faithful and true to this man. 
Then I started listing all the men, and and I started, you know, seeing how I had used these men. I had maybe they had used me. A lot of the women said, "Well, they used you too." I said, "This doesn't matter. This isn't their inventory. This is my inventory." So it's just like what Bob said. It's not about what they did. You know, the deal was we used each other. But it's, that's none of my business. That's not my business. What happened was is that I used them in order to make me feel better. I used them. And I had them down. And I didn't want to ever do that again. I didn't ever want to use a person again to fulfill my need to feel better. I had used my children. I had used my husband. Now I was using these men in AA. I was using sponsees. I mean, it was almost like it was, if I had these sponsees, it was, look at all the people I sponsor and stuff like that. And today, my God, it's not about how many people I sponsor. It's how many people allow me to sponsor them so I can stay sane. So it's, it was all of this self-centered stuff, and all the time I'm feeling, you know, Polly feels so bad about herself. Yet, didn't I start the ball in motion? So then it came down, and then it was the big, the big task. And uh, when I got sober, that one big secret that, you know, everybody says they have. Well, I'm not the kind of alcoholic. That had, well, I had a big secret. The, the secret was that I abused my children. But I, I was able to cough that one up because I was so full of guilt. And I, I just didn't know if I could stay sober because the reason I kept drinking again is just what Bob was saying about the guilt was because I was constantly harming my children. I am a child abuser, and I was constantly harming my children. So anyway, and, and Frank was very, you know, he, was, uh, he was, didn't use, you know, any kind of, you know, AA that's, you know, not straight out there. I can't think of the word I wanted to use right now. I'll, I'll think about it after I get down from the podium. But anyway, he told me, he said, Polly, you're a child abuser. He didn't say, Polly, you've harmed your kids, or Polly, you've done, Polly, you're a child abuser, and you're going to make amends to those boys. And I had done that. I had made amends to the boys. So that, so now this is three and a half years down the road. Now, my sons also got wind of what I was doing in AA. So I had them on the list. I forgot to mention that. I had the boys on the list again. And, uh, but Frank asked me, and this was the secret I kept from Frank. He said to me, is there anything else? And I just sat there and he said, Polly, we're willing to go to any lengths to stay sober. And if you don't tell, if you're not willing to get this out and share it, you may not stay sober. And what I had to share with him is that when I was two years sober, 38 years old, I sat in an abortion clinic and had an abortion sober. Keeping that from everybody. That's where it took me. Now, till five years ago, I couldn't share that. I just, I just still couldn't share that. And, uh, we started doing these things, and uh, it, uh, it seemed like I kept getting this inventory. And, uh, and what has happened is, and I know Dottie, when Dave and I went through bankruptcy and foreclosure, and I was just so horrified and so ashamed, and, uh, and, she, and her and Frank Honeycutt said, you have to share that from the podium. That's your experience. Those are things that have happened to you and could be happening to other people. 
And I didn't want to do that because I was ashamed. Well, this was way too horrible to be sober and this happened. Well, what has happened as a result of me doing what this book says to do, that I'm to share, I would share it one-on-one, but I would never share it openly. But what has happened as a result of me doing that is how many women are calling me who have had the same experience. I didn't think anybody in AA would have an experience like that. Nobody would do that. You know, I did it, but nobody else would do it. So what happened was, is I had to put that baby on the harms done list. And um, so what happened for me is I, be, I was able to do that and make and then be able to follow through with six and seven and eight and nine, even though and do it much like we do with people in our lives who die and we have to make amends to. Also on this harms done list, again, I had my sons on it because my behavior had affected my sons. So consequently, the sexual behavior that I've done in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous has brought to me great shame, great horrific shame, that I would do that sober. It somehow seems okay if you're doing it drinking. It just seems like, well, I was drinking. And it just somehow seems like that it's okay. But if you do it sober, it's, uh, I don't know for me, I'm just telling my story. It takes on a different, it takes on a different feeling. It takes on, it just like you should know better. And I say this all the time. If at this amount of sobriety, I should have been better than this. And I say that all the time because I know I'm a work in progress, and I will be, I guess, till they throw dirt on me. I'm, I'm sure I will be because when I, if I stop growing, then that's going to be it. But for me, what has happened as a result of that is that I was a person that Bob was talking about who would be quick to judge, quick to snap judgments, tell you what you ought to be doing, telling you this, telling you that. Well, today, I'm not so much like that. I truly believe that God is the judge. And I also believe that that it talks about that we do not want to be the arbitrator of anybody's sex conduct. What I'm going to tell, what I try to do is share with you, if you do that behavior, there is a price to pay. And I'm here to tell you I paid it. You want to pay it, you can pay it too. But what happens is, is because of those things, I am not so quick to judge. And I just know that I have a woman that uh, I've just tried not to judge what people do. I sponsor, I sponsor a lot of women. And a lot of them do things I think they ought not be doing. And if they'll ask me, what do you think of that? I'll probably say not very much. <laughs> I, you know, sounds like that, you know, you're, you're out. You're going to hurt yourself if you keep doing this. But, you know, it's your life. You live it however you need to live it. But it's your life. And But what sounds to me like what you're doing is hurting you. But then one more time, I don't know what God has in store for anybody's life. I don't know what God's contract is with you. And I had this woman that met this man on Match.com. They got those going on? Anyway, she met him. She lived in California, and he lived in San Angelo, Texas. She calls me up. She's never met him. Just talked to him on the phone. That she is going to San Angelo. She is moving to San Angelo, Texas. Not going to go for a visit moving. And she says to me, don't try to talk me out of it. 
okay. I said, well, at the time my mother had died, and I was going to be in Stanford, Texas, for several months taking care of my mother's stuff. And uh, I said, I'm going to only be two hours from you. So when this unravels, I didn't say (laughs) if. I said, when this unravels, I'm only two hours away. And, uh, And, of course, it did. It unraveled. But what happened is, and see, I never know what, what the journey is. What happened was, is she ended up going to San Angelo, Texas, absolutely fell in love with it. She's a yoga teacher. They didn't have any yoga in San Angelo, Texas. She opened a yoga studio, and oh, my God, she was absolutely in the right place she was supposed to be in. I just didn't understand how I got orchestrated. So who am I to know? Who am I to know? The only thing I said is, I'll be two hours away. Just please don't drink over this. Just please don't drink over it. If you don't drink, we probably can work it out. You know, you're going to be embarrassed. Your ego is going to be absolutely devastated. But it's like what happens is, smash your ego, grow God. We've heard that last night. We heard that this morning. Smash your ego, grow God. I really hate the price I've paid in AA. I just feel, you know, it just seems somehow that it would have been more acceptable, more whatever, if I had done those things drinking. Of course, I didn't get up off the sofa long enough to do those things drinking, but (laughs) it was... Nevertheless, it seems in my mind it would have somehow had some justification. But because I did it sober, the embarrassment, the humiliation, the things that I felt as a result of my behavior has helped me because what I do is who am I to throw the first stone? Who am I? Who am I to throw the first stone? I mean, so you're doing a little hanky-panky? Well, you know, we're, who was it that said that? Either Bob or Ralph last night. This is the only place in the world when we're all trying to find the worst bottom. Well, it's great if, you know, you're drinking and one of my sponsees slept with a one-legged minister. And, you know, that's funny. That's great. But it's not funny when you're doing that sober, married, and other people are involved in all this, in the lives. So what has happened for me is I'm kind of like it says in step seven in the 12 and 12. It doesn't seem like I get any humility, if I ever have any, any other way but through humiliation. And I've always got these sponsors standing in the wings here, and uh, Dottie's Dottie's the only one that's given direction now, but I used to have Frank Honeycutt, and I always love it because I got my... I got my buds back there that were that were know who I'm talking about when I say Frank Honeycutt, and who were there seeing me through these things. And Dottie's there now seeing me through these things. But what happened was is through that humiliation. And I once said to Frank Honeycutt, Frank, what will people say? What will people think about me if they know that we're in foreclosure, that we're filing bankruptcy? Dave and I are 16 and 17 years sober. This should be happening to newcomers, not people who are sober a long time. And Frank would say to me, Polly, it's none of your business what people think of you, but your life depends on what you think of them. I cannot afford to think badly about you. And the best way for me to cop a resentment about you is to judge something you're doing. And the minute I judge it, 
that becomes, I want you to do it the way I think you ought to do it. Well, you know what? Maybe you're not supposed to do it that way. Maybe that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Maybe your lesson is that you have to do it this way so that you can smash you and grow God. Maybe that's what has to happen. I don't know. It's not my business. But today, I'm going to do the best I can to stay around AA, do the things that God has asked me to do, work with the people that are put in my life. I am a person who, i, I got to tell this story too. One more little story. I go to, uh, Dave goes to Jacksonville, and uh, I don't have time to go with him, so he goes and finds a place for us to live. And everybody's saying, you trust him to do that? And uh, I said, well, he built the house we live in now, and I sure do like it. And our supervised building, he didn't nail anything. He just watched it. Um, but, and I said, I'm sure he'll be fine. So the lady that he uh, gets, totally God, totally God, our real estate agent calls this person in Jacksonville, and out of 5,500 or some ever how many, I don't know how many thousands of realtors, we get her. And Dave starts going around, and uh, she starts, you know, they kind of go around, and they get a little, and Dave, you know, you're not going to be with Dave very long before he's going to, you're going to find out that he's in AA or something's going on or however he's acting. And she starts talking about, well, she's got a daughter that's doing this and doing that and all this kind of stuff, and they're talking. The next thing happens is we go, Bob and I are doing a book study in Cocoa Beach, so Dave and I come in, and we're going to get to see the house and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, we're going to come back, and, well, we're going to go to Cocoa Beach, and I'm going to get to see the house. So here we come back, and that she's going to take us to lunch. And we're sitting there at lunch, and we're talking, and, and she says, well, are you in AA too? And I said, yeah. I said, uh, that's why we we're so lucky we got to come to Jackson. I came to Jacksonville, and we're going down to Cocoa Beach. And uh, she just kind of talked. The next thing I know, I get a text from her. says, please call me. And I called her back, and she says, I don't know what to do. I don't even know how to do this. She says, but I've been going to AA for about a month. And right now I have 11 days sober. But I've asked two women to sponsor me, and they're too busy. I hope none of you have done that. I can't even imagine being a brand new person and Alcoholics Anonymous and someone walk up to me and ask me to sponsor them, and I'm too busy. At any rate, I was delighted to sponsor her. So God is taking care of me in Jacksonville, Florida, because he sent me a newcomer right off the bat. <laughs> right off the bat. And what happens is, is believe me, a lot of times I will tell people, I may not have as much time as you need, but I sponsor lots of women who do it like I do, and that you, I could, maybe you would be better with them because they have more time. There's lots of things we can do besides reject a newcomer who it took all her guts to come up and ask if someone would sponsor them. And what I find it's even really funnier in AA is that what happens is, is we expect newcomers to come to us. You know, we didn't used to have to do that. You were assigned a sponsor. And I know in Southern California and in Bellingham, if anybody stood up in their first 30 days of sobriety, or especially if it was their first meeting, man, we were on them like white on rice. Do you have a sponsor? They said, no, I'm it. I promise you, they don't know any difference. They're newcomers. They don't know. They don't know they're supposed to interview sponsors. They just need to get one. And if it doesn't work out, like Bill says in language of the heart, 
you stayed sober. If they move on to somebody else, you got to go to a bunch of meetings and you stayed sober. And that's the miracle of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Just say yes. And if you say yes, I guarantee you, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how horrific it's been, I mean, I have had life in session the past since I've been sober. I have been married, divorced, lost my parents. I lost my dad when I was a year sober. Thank God I had done the steps and amends. I have, we have lost a child. We lost uh, our son 10 years ago. We have lost our home. Things have been happening. My husband has had open heart surgery. Life's been in session. But we say yes. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.